and welcome to this very special episode of Storyboard 18. I'm Dalshad Irani and we are in conversation with Mark Schneider, the global CEO of Nestle, only the largest food company in the world. Nestle also owns iconic brands, household names like Kit Kat, Nescafe and of course Maggie, which is an Indian pantry staple and one of the most loved brands in the country. We're absolutely delighted to have you on the show today, Mark, and lots to talk about. But I'm going to sort of kick in and quickly speak to you first about, about India. And uh, so can you begin with telling us about uh, what the agenda is for this trip to begin with? And um, what is your sense of where India is for Nestle on the global map? Well, thanks for having me. Very excited to be here this week in New Delhi. And um, what brought us here um, is a global board of directors meeting for the Nestle Group. It's the first international board of directors meeting after the COVID pandemic. And that, I think, in itself speaks for the importance that the Indian market has for us. So firsthand, we were able to experience uh, some of the shelf presence of our products and brands in Indian retail. We were visiting with our R&D center, so we operate an R&D center in this country. And we were also able to see the impact that Nestle has on supply chain, the, work, the way we work with farmers, and the immediate social impact that the company has. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if I were to ask you, where, where do you see uh, the India market in, say, five years' time? Uh, how, would you, how would you put it? Look, at the very least, I would tell you, this is the Indian decade. Uh, you, would, you could also say it's the start of the Indian age. And uh, you see a lot of the underlying strengths of this country coming uh, to the forefront now and really building upon each other. You see tremendous uh, growth uh, momentum. And uh, so we want to participate in that. I think we're a key part of it as a food and beverage player. And we've been in this country for so long, deeply ingrained in the social fabric of this country that I think we stand to benefit from that uh, momentum quite well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me just go back to sort of a sorry, sort of global picture question here. Um, how has how has this past how has this year fared for Nestle so far? Uh, what would you say is your report card for the company? I think is it's a very strong year when it comes to organic growth, and that applies to Nestle India, but it also applies to our performance globally. Some of that is driven by global inflation and pricing, but we also see very strong underlying uh, volume developments, especially here in India and some emerging markets. Um, very strong innovation momentum across the board. Uh, innovation to me is the chief, most sustainable growth driver in addition to population growth and economic development. And so very happy with the year. Obviously, when it comes to the global economic outlook, it's, it's a difficult time, a choppy mm -hmm. time a time when management needs to be very hands-on and focused on day-to-day -day operations. And I think the team has done a stunning job, including here in India. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let, me just, let me just ask you uh, to sort of dig into that a little bit and talk about some of the inflationary pressures that we're seeing globally. Yeah. Um, how, are you, how are you sort of working around that to sort of op offset some of, the, some of the issues that you will be facing in terms of rising input cost and, and keep away from you know, hiking prices too much? Yeah. So let's just let's get into that a little bit. Absolutely. And the hallmark of what we call responsible pricing is very important to us. Uh, so rather than just trying to offload everything to the consumer, I think we're looking for internal efficiencies as, as much as we can. This is a global job, but it also applies to Nestle India. And we understand that affordability uh, is a key aspect, especially in this country for vast areas of the population. And there's no point in engineering the perfect product that no one can afford. And so that's where product attributes and then affordability constantly need to be balanced. And I think we've done a very good job in that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in that respect, would you say, can you perhaps shed some light on what's happening in some of the other global markets? Yeah, so what we've seen from early 2021 is one shoe dropping after another when it comes to inflationary pressures in our supply chain. It started with con container shipping, which at the end of the COVID uh, first year really skyrocketed and uh, made our products almost more expensive. Energy prices uh, started to spike already in 21. Global shipping overall, in addition to containers and trucking, became more expensive. Then we had a bad coffee harvest in some key markets, and that drove up global coffee prices and also the prices of some agricultural commodities. 
And then what we're seeing now is um, the widespread feeding of that into labor cost. Mm -hmm. And so what you have from one thing that used to be single source only, container shipping, you now have inflationary pressures on almost everything that goes into your product cost. And that's a global phenomenon. Um, there's give or take a few percentage points differences between markets, but uh, there is no market that's exempt from it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. And it's critical you mentioned the affordability factor because, yeah. and that's been, of course, a hallmark of Nestle products. And uh, I mean, Maggie, for instance, you know, uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a pantry staple in India and it was comfort food for a lot of people during the pandemic. It was stockpiled in apocalyptic fashion. Um, so let me just sort of change tracks a little bit here and ask you about Maggie. Mm -hmm. um, it came back from the brink in absolute dramatic fashion after the 20, 2015 crisis. Um, you, you, weren't at, you weren't at Nestle back then. But if you could perhaps tell me, um, you know, when you when you look back at that time, when you joined Nestle, what were some of the what are some of the observations you made and some of the learnings that came out of that came yeah. out of that episode? Absolutely. And uh, let me say, first and foremost, the team and the leadership here in India have done a stunning job in gaining back the public's trust into this brand and um, also making it very clear and test after test that the product had always been safe and that there was no issue. And um, over and above that, rather than looking back, looking forward and seeing how can we address food safety? How can we maintain the trust of the public? How can we improve um, regulatory oversight? We started a food safety institute. Um, I think we're getting the point across to the public that we're incredibly committed to food safety and quality. And um, then of course, all the historic aspects and the strong and long-standing allegiance to that Maggi brand, mm -hmm. those were not gone. And um, couple of that with some meaningful product innovation, especially when it comes to the nutritional values and micronutrient fortification. And yeah, you have all the ingredients for a strong recovery. And that's what we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. There was something very interesting. In fact, your uh, your India MD Suresh had told me once about Maggie, which is it's it's, it's the truly masked customizable brand. There's a there's a Maggie version. Everyone has a Maggie version. So a slight a slight sort of detour here on the questions. Do you have a do you have a Maggie version? Look, with the European products, the mm -hmm. European range of Maggi, mm -hmm. um, the most iconic one is the original uh, mm -hmm. seasoning. And uh, I think every kid in uh, Germany and Switzerland grew mm -hmm. up with that on the table. And so, yeah, that's in our pantry at home. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we always add a sprinkle to a dish. Mm -hmm. And um, so it just gives it a spe very special flavor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, switching, switching tracks again here. Um, let's talk about the new bottom line people, planet, profits. Yeah. If, if you could just perhaps get into each of those aspects and tell me what Nestle is doing uh, to face, uh, to address some of those challenge, the challenges that you're seeing to sort of realize this new bottom line. Yeah. Look, increasingly people judge companies by what they're doing for society at large and uh, for the planet in the face of uh, growing environmental concerns. Obviously, people recognize that we are a for-profit company, so that's why the third aspect of the bottom line uh, shouldn't go out of uh, focus. But the first two, people and planet, I think that is becoming more and more important. The younger, the better educated, and uh, the more affluent consumers are, the more this is on their minds. And I think these days, in the age of smartphones and uh, a fully digital supply chain, the visibility on everything you do is so much higher, so there's no place to hide. Mm -hmm. I think that whole focus meets with a historic cultural um, aspect of ours quite well. And that is, we were always a stockholder company and uh, one that is uh, obviously um, subject to all the um, pressures and all the responsibilities that come with being a stockholder company. But in addition to that, this strong societal focus and a strong environmental focus that had been part of our DNA. When you're dealing with farmers around the world for more than 150 mm -hmm. years, when you see them exposed to the elements of the weather and uh, see them exposed to all the things that can go wrong in a bad season, uh, that puts planet thinking and weather thinking and climate thinking right into your DNA. And when you're feeding people around the world, as we do in more than 180 markets, uh, then clearly, you know, being part of society and having a strong societal concern or responsibility 
that's also part of our DNA. Mm -hmm. So to us, navigating in this new environment is uh, basically second nature. Let me get into some of the things that you are perhaps driving and that's top on your agenda in some of the specifics. Um, of course, we, we know that sustainability is an essential operating principle for uh, any responsible company and one striving for financial success. Um, so what is top on your agenda? What are you dialing up at this point in time? Yeah. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about that. So we are very committed to sustainability, as you say, and uh, obviously there's a whole list of issues. The one that I would describe as the defining one for our age and for our generation is climate protection and uh, reducing CO2 and methane emissions. Obviously, there's lots of our prior other priorities, but I'm very convinced that when the next several generations will look back to this age, uh, they will judge us by whether we get a handle on that situation or whether we just let it slip and flow and uh, that would have pretty catastrophic consequences for the climate around the world. So that one we're very committed to. We were one of the early signatories to the science-based targets to limit Earth's warming to one and a half degrees. We were one of the first people to issue then a very detailed um, net zero roadmap that would get us there by 2050. There is a commitment to get um, the greenhouse gas emissions down by 20% by the year 2025 and by 50% by the year 2030. So near-term action is also very important to us. Don't chop it down to the long term. Do something now in this decade. And this is also what the public is judging us by. We are already on our way down. Uh, so peak carbon is behind us. It was somewhere around 2018, 2019. We're on the way down mm -hmm. now. And that is in spite of the fact that the company is growing very strongly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sometimes there's a misconception. People say you want to reduce carbon emissions, but uh, when you have growth, don't you overcompensate? No. When we're saying minus 20 percent or minus 50 percent, that is after considering the growth. And so it's, it's a pretty meaningful reduction mm -hmm. when it comes to carbon per kilo of the products that we sell. On the subject of climate, let's talk uh, Let's talk a little bit about perhaps the plastic issue. Yeah. And uh, how, uh, I mean, FMCG companies, of course, uh, some largest consumers of plastic and eventually that becomes waste. Um, let's talk a little bit about what, what are some of the meaningful actions yeah. that you've taken with outcomes that have been desirable. And uh, where are you placed on, on sort of getting to this waste-free future. Absolutely. And plastics packaging would have been a close second right after climate protection when it comes to priorities. And um, you have a situation here where plastics packaging have been growing for 60, 70 years um, due to its superb properties when it comes to food safety and shelf life. And um, it's been only over time that societies around the world came to see some of the downsides. And that is when it spills into the environment, you have widespread pollution and the material doesn't degrade for long periods of time. So once we recognize this, uh, we made a pledge uh, that by the year 2025, our packaging should be recyclable or reusable. We're making very good, meaningful progress towards that. Um, obviously, it won't be done with that 2025 pledge alone. You have to think ahead of that and beyond that uh, because recyclable when there's no recycling infrastructure alone doesn't solve mm -hmm. the problem. So that's why the term you're using, the waste-free future, I think that's the ultimate goal. And that's why, you know, even with that intermediate uh, commitment to 2025, there will be lots of work left to do. Mm -hmm. We are, to my knowledge, the only large food and beverage company that has its own research institute for packaging sciences, because we did not just want to end up as a passenger to the packaging industry and whatever they have to offer. Mm -hmm. We also wanted to do our own research and development into better packaging. So one key focus, for example, is paperization. Um, paper packaging can take over from plastic packaging in many cases, but you have to check very carefully for food safety and shelf life Especially if you think about a climate like India with, mm -hmm. you know, high temperatures, lots of moisture. And so those are, that's the detailed work we're doing product by product. Mm -hmm. And keeping the cost in mind. Of course. And keeping the cost and affordability mm -hmm. in mind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, let me get a bit of your perspective on a sort of industry why from an industry perspective. Yeah. Um, do you think companies very often perhaps pass on the responsibility to consumers? Look, I think we all have to help. We got to do our part. And obviously, consumer behavior is another essential part to get the job done. 
So take recyclability. Um, you can make your packaging recyclable. Uh, you can also try to sponsor recycling infrastructure, but the consumer has to help because the consumer at the end of the day will also need to separate uh, some of the waste. And so I'm not in favor of just shifting responsibility in a wholesale manner to consumers, but we all have to help, whether it's as producers or consumers, uh, retailers, government, it's a systemic issue and we all have to do our part uh, to overcome it. Hold on to that thought. We'll take a quick commercial break and be right back to talk about how Nestle is future-proofing its brands and business by focusing on three aspects, people, planet and profits. Stay with us.